So friends, I want to welcome you to our 148th online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. This weekly gathering is called Courageous Leadership and it's sponsored by ELCA's Coaching Ministry. I'm Jill Beverlin. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the program manager for this ministry and one of your facilitators today. As part of my traditional land acknowledgement, I would like you to know that my home is located on the Fox River in Appleton, Wisconsin. This area is the ancestral territory of five nations of Native Indigenous peoples, the Menominee Tribe, the Ho-Chunk Winnebago Tribe, the Potawatomi Tribe, the Oneida Tribe, and the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans and the Brothertown community. I honor and respect the diverse Indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I live. And as we step into our time today, friends, I encourage us to remember that we are seeking to create a safer and braver space in these gatherings for you to bring the truth of who you are and how you are doing. These conversations are meant to be an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. So friends, again, greetings. It's always wonderful to be with you and especially on this first day of summer, the first official day of summer. Some of us have been experiencing summer a little longer than others. And today we are pleased and excited to welcome into our space two members of our National Young Adult Ministry team. So Jenna Lazat and Ian Hesseltine are our guests. Jenna is a Young Adults and Global Mission alumni and has served for two years as the manager for the Young Adult Networks and Alumni Engagement. She may have one of the best named cats on the planet too. And, and Jenna, is Beanbag close enough to make an appearance? He was, he might, he will probably make an appearance later. Okay. All right. And also Oliver, is, Oliver is the one that typically we see. Is that true? It sure is. There's Oliver, everyone. So yes, an introduction of Jenna is not complete without her cats. So there we go. <laughs> Oliver, always camera ready. Yes. And so friends, Ian is a candidate for word and service in the ELCA and is passionate about our calling to do church outside the four walls of a building and bridging the gap between young adults and the church. Ian currently serves as the Interim Vocational Fellowship Coordinator for ELCA's Young Adult Ministry, and I happen to know is just about to graduate from a Segment 1 Basic Skills Coach Training. So woohoo, go Ian! If you are fortunate enough to be in the same space as Ian, you can invite him to taste test some local brews along with you. It sounds like Ian would always say yes to this. So Jenna and Ian, thank you for who you are, for being willing to share your gifts, talent, and wisdom with us today. We really look forward to learning from you and having this important conversation. And with that, friends, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jill, Jason. This is awesome. Oliver, of course, has heard his name and is now... Um, voguing for the camera. Um, but yes, uh, oh my goodness, I have already gone too fast. Um, yeah, like I, I Jill wonderfully introduced us. Um, my name is Jenna. This is my colleague, Ian. We both work at ELCA Young Adults, um, and we are a current team of six. Um, should be eight or nine pretty soon, so very exciting. Um, but yeah, I serve as the manager for Young Adult Networks and Alumni Engagement, which means um, pretty much anything and everything. Um, and so I connect young adults to different opportunities within the church, to each other, um, run events, um, and, and other things like that. Um, I live in Orlando on unceded Seminole land. Um, I have two cats, um, a wonderful partner who I love very much, um, and a little tiny Prius named Lilith. Um, Ian, would you like to say anything, especially about vocational fellowship? Yeah, I would love to. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ian Hazeltine. Uh, I serve as the interim coordinator for the vocational fellowship, which is a brand new programming that we're launching as ELC and adults. Um, the program is a year-long discernment-based experience at the intersection of faith and uh, professional development. Um, so this looks historically has looked like programs like Luke and Volunteer Corps or Urban Servant Corps, uh, but the big, the big piece that we're shifting in our narrative um, is that young adults will make a living wage, which 
mind blown. It's crazy that young adults should want to make a living wage. Um, so I get the distinct honor and joy of launching the program this fall um, with 16 young adults. So we're thrilled uh, to get this with our ELCA partner organizations doing a variety of roles that we consider to be in ministry, but look look a lot like outside the four walls of a congregation, um, which I'm super, super psyched about. So yeah, grateful to be with you all. Um, I am usually uh, in the suburbs of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and today I'm coming at you um, from Alexander, Minnesota, about two hours west of there, um, where my parents are and where I grew up. Um, I have a Chevy Malibu that is named Max. Um, since Jenna shared her car name, I'll share mine. Um, yeah, that's and I have two siblings, but um, I am the middle of three. And all of our fellows are going to receive ELCA coaching, which is very yeah, they are. exciting. So very thankful for our partnership. But yeah, we'll just do a quick devotion. Um, and this is kind of one of our favorite devotions as a team. Um, this is kind of like our grounding for holy disruption. Um, so yeah, so this comes from Mark 2, 1 through 12. Um, so I'll read it and then say my a few little thoughts about it, and then we'll uh, get right into it. When he returned to, to I will speak correctly. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around there was no longer, so many gathered around there that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to him, to them. Then some people came bringing him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So this is, I'm sure a lot of us have heard this. This is the story about the leper being, or the paralytic being lowered on the mat through the roof by um, his friends to be healed by Jesus, right? And in this story, typically everyone wants to be the friends that are helping um, or even the paralytic that is receiving the healing. Some people might even want to be the healer um, and cast themselves as Jesus. Um, but you know what we never talk about is the person that owned the building, the person whose roof got a hole cut into it. That person, whether they like it or not, did holy work that day. They did quite literally holy, whole, whole, it's a pun, um, <laughs> disruption to get to Jesus for their friend. My prayer is that we as a church are not only willing to engage in holy disruption, but willing to be disrupted as the church. This has become part of our theological grounding for our acting purpose as our uh, ELCA Young Adult Ministry. We have a vision statement that we are called to connect, radically affirm, and equip all young voices for strategic justice, our strategic disruption, and divine justice. The ELCA has been an institution that acts to preserve itself, and I hope that we can allow God to transform us into an institution that prays for communities who are seeking healing and justice, that they may bust down the doors when our, bust down our ceilings when our doors aren't open, and that we might welcome them when they do. So with that, receive this blessing. I bless your love that I freed you to. I bless your cries, your justice and your cries. I bless your unapologetic rejection of lies. I bless your marches and your planet saving screams. I bless your rejections of the per prisons bursting at the seams. I bless your chemically different brains and your neurodivergent ways. I bless your holy anger and doubt and unsurety. 
I bless your pure, your clean, your profanity. You are my co-creating divine uncoverers. You are my Holy Spirit redemption discoverers. You see me in ways that have never existed because I've been waiting for you to show off this piece of me. When the world calls your divine ingenuity chaotic defamation, remember they are confusing chaos with creation. Blessed are you, my beloved. Amen. Now with that, um, this is, some of you might have gone through the Growing Young curriculum, and so some of this might be new to you, some of this might not. Um, this is kind of what we see, um, not just our church, but churches in general, um, from looking at younger generations, millennials and down, so Gen Z um, in particular, since a lot of millennials are um, a little bit older now, which is weird for me to think because I'm a millennial um, and I don't feel like an adult, but <laughs> it's because I'm a young one. So a couple of these insights, you can kind of see the, me, the main key points here. Um, you know, instead of centralizing authority, we're empowering young people, um, empathy over judgment. And so a lot of what we like to say is turning judgment into wonder. Um, you know, this upcoming generation and the generation after them are experiencing things that are just in a completely different context than a lot of what my generation and your generation and other generations grew up with. Um, welcome young people into a Jesus-centered way of life. Um, you know, not a, a lot of young people see lip service um, as a disservice, really. Um, and so when we're talking about, um, you know, people becoming disillusioned with the church, that's a lot of it, right? Is they see um, these messages in the Bible and then people are not um, walking the walk. And so fueling warm communities, this is, again, this is a huge one, um, especially for young adult ministries. People are like, all right, where are the young adults? How do we get them in? How do we engage them? This is like the, the these are the findings is that they're warm peer and intergenerational friendships. This is looking for um, interpersonal welcome, warm. This isn't like who's got the coolest worship, who's got the coolest music, who's got the flashiest lights. Yes, in some instances, those can be important and those can be a draw, but what keeps people um, engaged and what keeps people um, like coming back is those personal relationships that we have. And again, we're prioritizing young people everywhere. So instead of just saying we really want young people, we need young people, look for ways to support and uplift and equip young people as well. So not just being like, yay, they're here, we have diversity metrics, really including them in the levels that they want to be included. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, of just not tokenizing them and throwing them in every position that you could possibly find for them because we're like, oh my gosh, one young person, yay. Um, but including them in a way that makes them feel like a fully fledged member of your ministry because they are, or they will, they want to be, and that's why they're there. And again, being the best neighbors that you can be. And so welcoming people that might look very different from you, whether that be in age or race or sexuality or gender expression, whatever that looks like, when you are a welcoming ministry and a welcoming congregation, people recognize that and they can tell that and people feel a lot more comfortable being them, their, their true selves with you and also showing up. Um, so that is kind of what... Um, the, the growing young like overview looks like. And so innovation did some Gen Z research. And so we have an innovation team here at the ELCA um, churchwide office and they are great. So um, if you want more information, please, I'm sure Jill and Jason would be happy to pass their information along. Um, and so Gen Z is loosely 1999 to 2015. There's a lot of people that are very angry about this. Like they're like, no, 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 it's 1998, it's 2000. Generally speaking, um, these are what we call like the screenagers, you know, people that have grown up um, in a very different context than, um, you know, the generation before with the millennials, right? We're growing up in um, a largely post-Christian context. We're growing up um, kind of having a lot of global mass violence um, be something that's normalized while they're growing up during like these very early stages of development. Um, we're seeing a lot more increasing acceptance of talking about mental health, um, talking about gender and sexuality, um, stuff like that. 
And we are also, we, I say, I was born in 96. I'm not a Gen Z. Um, they are the largest and most diverse group that we have seen thus far. And so seeing that, um, it can freak a lot of people out. They're like, oh my gosh, they're, they're the largest group. And yet we don't see any of them in our churches unless they are children that are being brought by their parents. And then once they go to high school or college, they start dropping off. Um, and a lot of Gen Z people are more interested in a global context, right? Globalization has been rapidly increasing since the dawn of the internet. And these people, these this whole group is um, very adept at using the internet and that that's like their native language. And so um, meeting and seeing people all over the world, global context matters to them. Um, and so it's not just what's happening in their community that matters. They can kind of see what happens over there is also um, impacting them. And so you can see this graph um, from the from Barna, and they pulled people um, broken up by age to see who um, among practicing Christians has experienced depression or anxiety. And you can see a perfectly uh, straight line, a diagonal line here of 58% of Gen Z participants in this survey said that they have experienced depression or anxiety. That is a lot of people and 53% of millennials. And so that's the majority for our two youngest generations right now um, that have experienced depression or anxiety. And we're not talking about it in churches perhaps as much as we should be, or we're not making space for things like that. Um, and so while you're developing this, you know, keep in mind, um, you know, we're already dealing with a global pandemic. Um, a recession that's inching into a depression. Um, and then you see all of these Gen Z people um, and they're looking for community. They're looking for something that feels like it matters. And if they're not getting it from the church, they're going to find it somewhere else. And that's okay in a lot of instances, but if you are looking to get Gen Z, this is like a good thing for you to know. Sorry, my outlook is going crazy. Um, so the traditional path of, man, it is really going crazy. Um, so the traditional path of what we would, you know, call a young adult or, um, you know, just somebody growing up, we tend to think of it as you go to high school, you go to college, you get a job, you get married, you have kids. You know, sometimes it's like, okay, you go to high school, you go to college, you get married, then you get a job, then you have kids. But this is like what we think of as the general path of like how things should be. And even if, you know, you don't think that yourself, that's still, you know, kind of the, the dominant narrative. And what we see is that in millennials and Gen X or Gen Z is that this is more of the realistic path of what it looks like, right? Like there's gap years and then you're traveling abroad. Maybe you do a Yagam year and then you're living at home and then maybe you get a job and then maybe you lose your job and you have to live back with your parents. That's been me. Um, you're living with your partner or your roommates. You get an internship and then you're back to a job and then you and, you know, marriage might be part of that. Kids might be part of that. But we're seeing a decline in both of those things um, as generations wear on, right? And so this, and this, this is um, applicable to um, faith formation, right? Our faith formation right now is basically like shunting people along gently, not like meanly, but you know, you go from children's ministry to youth ministry, and then you're doing your youth ministry in high school, and then college, maybe you'll do campus ministry, but maybe not. Then you get a job, and then you get married in the church, of course, and you have kids, and then you're back in the church because you've got kids, and then you, they can do the children's ministry, and you feel involved. And what we're seeing is that a lot of people don't feel like they have a place in the church because they don't follow this path. They don't have kids or they're not married or, you know, they're in between jobs and they already kind of feel like they don't fit in with what the rest of society believes that they should be doing. And so they already kind of feel like they don't have a community in some instances. And so they walk into a church and when there's only programming for like children or, um, or just adults, but they go to the small group and it's all older, older, older adults. And they're like, oh my gosh, they just don't see themselves and they don't feel like they have a place to fit in. And when our faith formation is only relegated to this, we really lose a lot of people. And I think you all have seen that, right? And so making space for this, you know, what kind of questions are we asking 
for how do we engage people in every single part of this wacky line that is, you know, the traditional young person's life. Um, yeah, so these are kind of the three critical questions that people are asking. This is from the Barna and Fuller um, research that they have been doing with the ELCA um, and specifically with our senior director for young adult ministry, Daniel Kirschbaum. And so they found that through their theological reflection, their studies, that what it means to be human, which is a very large claim, you can take it or leave it, but this is what Barna and Fuller say, that there are three ultimate questions, right, that people are asking, young people. Who am I? Where do I fit? And what difference do I make? So if we're going to emphasize that today's uh, young people are important. If we're going to empathize with them, we have to explore these three questions in all of your contexts, right? In ministry, in congregations, in parachurch uh, organizations. These are the three things that keep people awake at night. Thinking back to when you were a young adult, you know, we define young adults as 18 to 35. Which of these big questions surfaced most for you while you were, you know, in this space of discernment? And you know, you're still probably thinking about this, right? Like this doesn't stop being a thing once you hit 35. Like I'm not going to turn 35 and be like, I have it all figured out. That would be great. But every adult has told me that that is nonsense. So I'm going to believe them. Um, but these are, while you're, you know, in your stages of development, these are like at the foremost front of, of Gen Z and, and young adults' minds. And so the first one is, uh, who am I? So that's identity. So where do you fit is about belonging. And then what difference do you make is about purpose. So, you know, like I said, as we get older, these questions become a little less important because we have a little bit more um, sense of self, sense of identity. Hopefully, obviously, that's not going to be the case for every single person. And we are always discovering ourselves every each and every day. Um, but again, these are like at the forefront of young adults' minds right now. And so again, while you're thinking about, um, you know, programming and where are we meeting young adults and like, what's their problem? Why aren't they coming to church? Think about these three questions. And so where we see a lot of success as young adult ministry um, is a couple of things. And again, I'm going to preface this all by saying like, it depends. That's like my favorite thing to say is it depends. Everything is contextual, right? We, this is not a one size fits all. And that's why we as young adult ministry focus less on making as many So Ian, are you prepared to take the baton from your colleague who froze mid-sentence? <laughs> yes, I would love to. Um, let me, um, give me one second to pull up Jenna's Canva here. I was telling uh, Jill and Jason at the onset of our Ooh. session that um, my computer is on the fridge this week. And so I, I'm working mostly from my phone and my sister's school computer. And so I just need a moment here to pull up uh, where Jenna was in the middle of her thought. Uh, but where we see success is where she was uh, leading us. And it really does depend contextually on where you are. Um, Jenna said her power cut out. So that's where she went. Um, so, uh, so sorry that I don't have these slides to share here actually um jill if i email this to you would you be able to pull this up for me if if you can email it to jason that would be jason? even better okay we everyone in this space knows that <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, and friends while ian is doing that i will just respond to so many of the things that, that Jenna and Ian are laying out. I'm just coming out of Synod Assembly season, and I am um, invited to be a representative of the churchwide office at many Synod Assemblies. And one of the things, one of the consistent mantras that I hear is, 
we really wish we had more young people at our church. We thought we'd have more young people. If we don't get more young people, our church is going to die. And I would love for those of you that have your cameras on, raise your hand if that's something that you've heard in your current faith community, right? Or if that's something that, if that's a thought that crosses your heart, <laughs> right? I mean, it's there. And I really think, I think two things, and I, I, I jotted this down. One is, I wonder if, if we're even asking the right question. I think that we are so concerned over like attracting and trying to get those, those youth and young adult butts in our pews that it's almost like that's become the goal. Like get them in the door so we can extract something from them. And I don't think that that's the right posture nor the right question. And the other thing that I, I ask us to wonder about is I wonder if God is inviting us to focus on just what we were hearing Jenna and Ian set up that that youth and young adults are people who have been gifted specifically by God and what does it look like if we want to invite them into whatever it is that spirit is doing in our community that my friends has a very different vibe to it that my friends recognizes that each person is is a valued beloved person of God and that we recognize that moving forward, our puzzle is incomplete unless we are all together. And, and, and how does that feel for the youth or the young adult to hear that message versus we're so desperate and we're relying on you to save our church, right? So with that, Ian, did I buy you enough time? Are you good to go? Yeah, I'm back. I'm so sorry. I'm back to you. I texted Ian. I was like, my internet. Recording in progress. Oh, hold on. Now there's two. <laughs> Technology is not the friend of our team this week. Um, but. Uh, I'm so sorry. Oh, my goodness. Yay. Yes. Um, remember when I said I lived in Florida, the storms knocked out my power for a hot second and everything restarted. Um, <laughs> so, so sorry about that. Oh my goodness. Um, no need to be sorry. Life happens. Thank you all for your grace. Um, yeah, I don't know. Jill, Ian, where did, where did we leave off? Our, our mid thought here was it, uh, it's contextual based, right? Um, that, that the, what we see is that one thing that works in one context might not work in another. Um, but one piece that we really, really see success in here, especially when it, in terms of context being different, is our is the Gather Network. Um, Jenna, do you want to talk a little bit more about Gather? Yeah. So Gather is our kind of, uh, it's not really an ELC young adult ministry program. It is us. It is an example of us stewarding and providing resources um, and finances to a program that kind of already existed and started cropping up very rapidly across the United States in really exciting ways. And the leaders of these gather networks started coming to us and were like, hey, we're all kind of doing the same thing. Like, why don't we all come under one brand so it's easier for young adults to find us? And we're like, yes, love it. So the gather network is in-person, regionally defined groups of young adults that meet regularly, whatever that means, weekly, bi-weekly, quarterly, monthly, whatever it means in their context. Um, but they meet, they're all young adults. The leadership is at least 50% young adults. More often than not, it's 100% young adults. Um, and these are not just owned by one congregation or one ministry, but these are a cooperation um, between uh, ministries. And so it could be two congregations, five congregations, uh, a synod, um, a campus ministry and a congregation, an outdoor ministry and a campus ministry. And so it can, looks very different in a lot of um, different contexts. And so right now we have um, currently five like sites that are on the website, ready to go. And we've got like 30 more in development with people applying every single day and um, applying for grant funding to get their own gather network off the ground. And the beautiful thing about the Gather Network is not only um, young adults don't feel as much pressure in these spaces, right? They don't feel like they need to be a member of the church in order to feel like they belong. And I think that's really important. 
is that like church membership is super important for your form C and your form A and your form B and all of those things I don't understand because I'm on the complete opposite side of all of that church stuff. But it's important for a lot of things. And also it's not the only metric of success in your ministry. Um, having people that are showing up and are interested and are willing to engage in your in the work that you're doing and the work that um, they're doing with other young adults is super important. And so I think it's a shift too of like what metrics are we measuring for, like what engagement looks like. And often it, it happened to be baptisms and donations and butts and seats for every Sunday morning and membership. Um, but we're seeing that, you know, young adults don't necessarily follow those patterns, especially as a lot of young adults are in stages of transition in their life. Maybe they're moving around a lot. Maybe they travel a lot for work. And so they just don't have a home congregation, but they're still looking for a faith community. And so a lot of the young adults in the Gather Networks are members of other churches, or they're not members of the ELCA at all, and they're ecumenical partners, or they're just... Um, you know, discovering what religion means to them, and they're just kind of dipping their toes back into what it looks like. And Gather looks different every single site that it is. And so sometimes it's dinner church, and it's just a meal, and young adults are hanging out and talking together. Sometimes it's like a book club on a really cool theology book or a social justice um, nonfiction book. Sometimes it's literally just hanging out and doing a mini worship or singing. We have um, communion if there's somebody that is um, ordained or not. There's snacks. It's very low budget. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people, that trips a lot of people up is they're like, oh my gosh, these young adults, they need things that are flashy and like they need all this crazy production. And no, like what young adults, especially during the pandemic is what we saw Young adults want to be in community with each other, especially in person. They want to feel like they belong. They want community that means something. They want real, deep connection to the places that they are and the places that they want to be. And they don't need all of the flashy productions and lights and the most contemporary music you've ever heard in your life. Um, you know, and, and all of those things have their places, right? I love, I love a good high church worship. Oh, that's my favorite, right? But it, when I want to be around other young adults that have similar experiences as me, you know, some people come together and commiserate. They're like, oh my gosh, it's so hard to be a young person in this church. Or, oh my goodness, how exciting is it to be a young person in this church and to be, you know, wanted in spaces and to be like, people are super excited when I walk into the door. Um, and, and being able to explore that in a, in, in a different context than just a traditional worship. It's also really helpful for people that don't feel comfortable in the four walls of a church or six walls or however a cube works. Um, you know, some of these don't meet in churches. Some of them do, but some of them meet in, you know, somebody's house and it rotates, you know, which young adult is hosting. And that feels a lot more accessible for people than walking into a church, especially if you have a lot of church trauma growing up walking back into that space can be really, really hard. And so um, reimagining what ministry looks like outside of the four walls of a church and outside of membership, I think is kind of on the forefront of a lot of young adult ministry and what's happening in young adult ministry. And again, that, that sense of um, territorialness is what we come across a lot of like, okay, so I have a young adult and you have a young adult across the, you know, the other Lutheran church across the street. And like, there's another young adult on the other side of the, the thing, but we, we all have to have our own things. It's okay to share. Sharing is great. We love sharing. Jesus loves sharing. We should also love sharing. And so we don't have to be defensive and protective over the young people that do show up. Um, and they feel like they matter more than a number when you're like, oh my gosh, like I know of other opportunities that connect you with maybe something that isn't what we're doing, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, authentic inclusion. Again, are we just telling young adults to just do everything? Are we like, oh my gosh, thank God. We have, we have built-in tech. We have an IT person now. And this like young person's like, I churn butter in my free time. I don't understand how to work PowerPoint. There are some young adults that do that. I don't know. Um, you know, are we forcing them or not forcing them, but asking them pretty, pretty, please, will you be on every committee? Will you go to Senate assembly? Will you be the voting member? Will you do this? And that? Some young adults really want to do all that. Love that. Encourage that, equip them, but not everyone does. Some people are just like, I just want to be a member at a church and that's it. 
I don't want to be on every committee. I don't even know what a synod council is. I just want to do my little, you know, worship thing and then I'm done. And that's okay, right? You wouldn't necessarily ask that of just like a random uh 40 something person that walked in. So don't do it to every young adult you see. But if they are excited, please, please, please give them opportunities because they got a lot of energy. I got a lot of energy. Talk all day. Um, again, and warm welcome. That's super important. I think like the, the the biggest thing that I've seen from the past couple months, especially, is like young adults being like, it is so weird church shopping as a young adult because either you walk into a congregation and they all look at you like, oh my gosh, a young person. What do we do? And everyone just freezes. And you're like, great. Now I'm I'm like the circus, like freak show here. And now everybody's gonna look at me like I'm a lab rat. And it's it's uncomfortable because you're like, again, sometimes you just want to be a member of a church and you don't want to feel um like you're there just to be a diversity um point for somebody's congregation. And sometimes we go into churches and nobody even looks at us. And so I've seen, I've heard a lot of things from young adults lately that have been like, we walked into a church and not only did they not know what to do with us, they just didn't, they didn't acknowledge us at all. Nobody greeted me. The pastor didn't want anything to do with me. Nobody asked me why I was there. And like, that was super demoralizing. And so we hear it on both ends of the spectrum, right? And so just like authentic inclusion, a warm welcome, that's really what people are looking for is for a place to belong. And if your congregation isn't like welcome and open and ready to receive people from all over that's okay but don't don't force yourself to do it until you're actually ready and so like i'm from the florida bahama senate and so um our wonderful bishop suarez was talking about how you know a lot of churches in the florida bahama synods are retired churches and he's like, you don't have to retool and start a bunch of preschool ministries if you're not getting any preschoolers and you don't necessarily have the time or capacity to start a preschool ministry. There are other places that can do that. Just know your strengths and don't be confused when there's no preschoolers showing up because you don't have a preschool ministry and you don't want preschool. You know, you know what I mean? Like, so play to your strengths and it's okay. You don't have to be a congregation that does everything. As long as you are resourced mm -hmm. to other congregations and other ministries that are doing things, that's like the best part of my job is being able to network and being like, well, we can't actually do that, but I know who can. And so knowing the people in your community, in your synod, being able to reference, you know, other ministries is also super powerful and also is like a huge point for young adults that are like, oh my gosh, like you're willing to help me even though I'm not going to be a member or, you know, maybe I will be a member, but I'm going to go to this other ministry as well. There's a lot. I don't know. Ian, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I just wanted to repeat what you just said. Your congregation does not have to be everything. Um, that's huge. And as a young adult who is church shopping, please find your way somewhere in the middle don't gawk and freeze but also I don't need 10 people to approach me I I am technically a cusper of the Gen Z and 99 baby and um, not mad about it but I do feel like I'm in the in between there um so yeah we we again like Jenna said we're seeking spaces of belonging um, we had a young adult mission star congregation in Minneapolis and it's closing this weekend, a holy closure, um, and our gather is only quarterly. And so, like, I have felt loss as a young person in this church, trying to find that place where I belong. Um, and so these two pieces that Jenna highlighted are so important. Um, I mean, that really, really, really does hit at um, what we're seeking, so... Jason, if you want to move to the next slide, that'd be great. And here are our breakout questions. I know Jill said two to four, and I put more than that, um, because I love options. We love options. So, and these are tough questions, right? Like, are you ready to receive young adults? Like, are you actually committed to receiving young adults, or do you just want to be seen as the congregation that has a lot of young adults? Those are not fun questions to think about and to reflect upon, I know, um, and that's okay, right? Like Ian and I said, you don't have to do it all. It's exhausting to want to do it all or to feel like you have to do it all, but if you are committed to something like that, commit. 
you know, like go all the way, go or not maybe all the way, but, you know, commit to being a welcoming congregation and to doing the work. Um, and, you know, again, play to your strengths. And so these are hard questions. And also the young people that are going to be coming into your congregations that you want to um, see are also going to be asking these hard questions. And you don't want to be caught off guard or feel like you're like, oh my gosh, like they expect so much from us. These are tough cookies. Some of them are tough cookies, especially, listen, if you are under the age of 35 and you have stuck with Christianity for this long, you are a tough cookie. That's all I'm going to say. But yes, these are the discussion questions. <laughs> Excellent. So friends, I don't know if you need Jason to put that back up um, so you can take a picture of them. And uh, I see that there is a great question about the Gather Network and how we can find out if one exists in our area. I promise you when you come back from your discussions, we'll have that information ready. And Jason will also post that with this recording. All right. So Jenna and Ian, thank you so much for the information that you've shared and for setting us up well for our breakout room discussions. Friends, we are going to come back to the space at five till the hour to give you some time to chew on these great questions that Jenna has teed up for us. Thank you. Blessings on your conversation. So as is our habit, this is the time that we invite um, our participants to unpack, keeping the confidence of your small group buddies. What are some things that you learned in your conversation? What are some themes that bubbled up for you? The difference between church and worship, between being at worship and being church. Okay, say more, Deb. Um, it didn't come from me. <laughs> oh, okay. Where'd he go? It came from me. <laughs> yeah, where are My you? My friend Mukesh. <laughs> yeah, so the question, yes, I ask, the question that I ask is, when we talk about church, I believe we are actually talking about inviting people to worship and not church. And the question I am asking is what really is worship or the purpose of worship and what really is a church? And if we can distinguish that or identify that, then it helps us to be the church. So I see worship is to uh, equip members to be the church. So when we are talking about inviting people to church, you're not inviting people to church. You're inviting them to be a, a part of our worship that they grow in their faith formation, then become the church. What we are talking as youth ministry, until that, I believe, until that dynamic change, people will not be disciples. They are going to be members of a congregation. They are not going to be disciples to open to that word church as a whole, because then church will mean different or mean differently for people. So that's that's where I'm coming from. Excellent distinction, Mukesh. Thank you. And Deb, thank you for bringing that to the forefront. How about another one? What we uh, discussed was, sorry. Gani, you go oh. and then Jack. Okay, okay. What we discussed that we are not sure if we are ready, right? It's more like we have to learn, I think, language, uh, ask the better questions and be be really ready. And I, I was actually, when that was discussed, I thought of, um, I don't want my, the older people in my church, every time they, when my kid comes home from college, they always ask the same questions, right? So my kid is now like, I don't want to go to church because then uh, what is your major? What is, so almost to train, uh, each other to ask better questions and be really interested. And so we have to learn a lot still. Sure. And so what would it look like in our congregations, taking Yanni's suggestion, if before the typical college breaks come and we anticipate young adults coming back from college and being in our worship space again, what would it look like if we put an insert in the bulletin <laughs> for a couple of weeks, just giving some different questions to ask, right? that would disrupt our typical mantra that we bring to a conversation with a young adult. Yeah. So Jack, how about you? I don't have a, a, a wise insight, but I do have a comment. Jenna and Ian, you are making me dizzy. 
I'm trying to keep up with you. I can't do it. Thank you. You're like pouring out all of this. It's very good. It's an excellent, excellent session. How does that feel, Jenna and Ian, to receive that kind of compliment? Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, no, it is a lot. And I feel like showing up uh, to work every day kind of feels like drinking from a fire hose. So I get it. Sure does. <laughs> sure does. But it's great. I'm glad, I'm glad you're just in a dizzy phase and not in a ever, never ending cycle of it. Some point you'll, you'll reorient yourself and then there you'll be and you'll be like, oh, okay. Someday the fire hose does gradually turn off. And the water is more drinkable. So, yeah, we're appreciative. And Ian and Jenna, we are appreciative of you. And again, your time, just the essence of who you are and for bringing these concepts to the table for us to begin wrestling with. And I think that one thing that we have learned today is that this is not a one-off. This is a continuing conversation. So we will be asking you, maybe specifically the both of you or others from your team to come in and continue this conversation with us because it's something that we are leaning into and growing into. And so friends, one of the things that I don't know that we heard from our presenters today that I believe is typically something that is important to the hearts of our young adults and that is how we've cared, how we are caring for creation. And um, if you had like a list of the top 10, 10 topics that are near and dear to the hearts of young adults, I think, Jenna, am I right? Is that something that's true? So um, next week, friends, our friend and colleague, Phoebe Morad, who is the executive director for Lutherans for Restoring Creation, will be in this space and will be talking to us about the concept of caring for creation. And I think that there are a lot of ties into this. Um, related to young adults as well. And so with that, Jenna, I want to, so I hope to see you next week. And Jenna, I wanna invite you to give us a last word or an encouragement as we leave our space today. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jason, again, for this incredible opportunity. And I just thank all of you for listening. It is definitely not easy. Um, it's not easy doing this work. And it's not kind of, it's not easy being on the other end of trying to figure out how to do this work as well. And so I'm just so grateful that each and every one of you have shown up and are willing to engage in hopefully a little bit of holy disruption um, as we move forward and um, to help best equip, affirm, and and um, support the young adults in your contexts. Amen. Beautifully said, friend. We look forward to having you back again. With that, God bless you on the rest of your week. We look forward to being together again with Phoebe, Lutherans for Restoring Creation, continuing this important conversation of what it means to be a courageous leader. Friends, as we leave, please know, as always, that you are seen, you are valued, and you are loved. <laughs>